Our Heavenly Father, uh, we're uh, thankful to be here in such uh, an exciting but solemn time in this earth's history. And Lord, we're thankful for the calling that you have placed upon each, each of us uh, here in the final hours of earth's history. Um, we know that those who will overcome the beast, his image, uh, his name, and his number will those that will be called chosen and faithful. And so we uh, desire to be a part of that number. Uh, we desire to uh, be able to uh, give this message uh, with a loud cry and also uh, exemplify it as well. So Lord, I ask and pray as we study today that your spirit would uh, descend upon us um, as he has been doing thus far, leading and guiding us into all truth but also giving us and empowering us uh, to be able to live this message. Uh, bless us as we study today. Uh, anoint our eyes with the eye salve that we might see. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning we're going to get into a particular study. In fact, uh, this study I was in the early stages of developing, and uh, it was a study that came to my my attention is as I begin to just kind of recall and look at the events of the last days um, and in relationship with their uh, connection to the closing scenes of the life of Christ. Um, and that this study is going to be uh, primarily on the image of the beast. Um, what is, you may ask what the significance of the image of the beast is. Uh, in fact, we're told in the great controversy and we'll read that particular quotation soon here. Uh, and that is that, that the significance of the image of the beast is that the image of the beast is the test for Adventists. Uh, that's what the prophet of the Lord says. She says that she was shown that the image of the beast is the, is the test for us. Um, and so as we're reviewing and as we have been reviewing the life of Christ, uh, we're going to see if the image of the beast was the test uh, for the, God's people in that time or at that time as well. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to look at a couple of statements here in the spirit of prophecy as we move forward. Let me back up here. Uh, this is a statement that <clears throat> is a powerful statement for us specifically. Um, uh, we need to become familiar with this. This is taken from Maranatha, page 20, or 217. And it says, the whole world is to be stirred with enmity against seven day Adventists because they will not yield uh, homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power. It is the purpose of Satan to cause them to be blotted out from the earth in order that his supremacy uh, of the world should not be, may not be disputed. Every position of truth taken by our people will bear the criticism of the greatest minds. Uh, the highest of the world's great men will be brought in contact with the truth and therefore every position we take should be critically examined and tested by the scriptures. Now we seem to be unnoticed, but this will not always uh, but this will not always be. Movements are at work to bring us to the front, and if our theories of truth can be picked to pieces by historians or the world's greatest men, it will be done. So this is why we need to understand not just only the doctrines that we hold, but what else do we need to understand? It says if our theories of truth can be picked to pieces by who? Historians. historians. So we need to understand history as well. This is why it's Important for us to understand the old paths, okay? We need to understand history. Uh, moving forward, she goes on to say, we must individually know for ourselves what is truth and be prepared to give a reason of the hope that we have with meekness and fear, not in a proud, boasting self-sufficiency, but with the spirit of Christ. We are nearing the time when we shall stand individually alone to answer for our belief. And so we, we've seen... A couple of times already that she tells us that we need to be individually able alone to be able to stand for the truth. She says that we're to do it not with the spirit of Gadol, not in pride, not in boasting, not in self-sufficiency, but uh, with the spirit of Christ. Humility, meekness, as we have studied before. It says we shall be attacked on every point. We shall be tried to the utmost. We do not want to hold our faith simply because it was handed down to us by our fathers. Such a faith will not stand the terrible test that is before us. We want to know why we are Seventh-day Adventists. How are we going to know why we're Seventh-day Adventists? How? How is it that we know why? 
Well, we have to go back to the beginning to know why this movement was started. We have to go back to the old past. That's the only way that we're going to know why we're Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, we want to know why we're Seventh-day Adventists, what real reason uh, we have for coming out of the world as a separate and distinct people. Now, what does Sister White tell us? What brought us out of the other churches as a separate and distinct people? It was the messages that came in between 1840 and 1844. Okay? So this is why. These reasons why. These are the reasons why we have been brought out of the other churches, why we have been brought out of the world. So just once again, pointing back to the old past, because one day very soon we are individually uh, going to stand for our own or on our own to give a reason of the hope that we have within us with meekness and fear. Now, moving forward, <clears throat> this is the quotation I was referring to. Uh, this is seven, seven Bible commentary, 976. It says, the, lo the Lord has shown me, what's that next word? Clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before the probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. So she says that the image of the beast is to be, bef is to be formed before probation closes, for this is the great test for who? The people of God. Well, when does probation close for the people of God? The Sunday law, right? So the image of the beast has to be formed before the Sunday law, okay? So notice what it goes on to say. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. Are we sealed prior to the Sunday law? Yes, this, we're living in the sealing time right now, okay? So this test, when is this test taking place? When is this test of the image of the beast taking place? Right now, if, if this is the sealing time now, she says, this is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. You know that sealing, the sealing is the settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God, Jehovah, and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of the heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. Now, what did Christ, in fact, what did Christ say about his kingdom? Uh, notice what your Bible says in the book of John chapter 18 and verse 36. John chapter 18 and verse 36. <clears throat> we know that the image of the beast what is the image of the beast? The image of the beast is a union of two things, church and state, okay? Church and state. This is to be the test for the people of God. She says that the Lord has shown her clearly that the image of the beast was to be the test for the people of God. Now we're turning to John chapter 18. What does Christ say about his kingdom? John chapter 18, verse 36. Notice what your Bible says. It says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is what? Not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom. It says, but now is my kingdom not from hence. So we see here Christ very plainly states that his kingdom is not of this world. Uh, he says, listen, if his kingdom was of this world, then his servants would fight. He says, uh, and I like what he says here. He says that he should not be delivered to who? The who? The Jews, right? Who are the Jews? His people, right? So Jesus says, listen, if my kingdom was of this world, then my servants would do what? Fight. Well, wait a minute. Did, weren't the Jews the servants of God? They were supposed to be. But remember, he came unto his own and his own received him not. So he says, but listen, my servants are not going to fight so that I can be delivered into the hands of the Jews. Okay. So notice what it goes on to say as we continue to read. In fact, let's turn to the book of Matthew chapter 19. So Christ first stating, number one, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, uh, the spiritual kingdom of Christ has nothing to do with the kingdoms of men. They're not connected. His kingdom is not connected in any way with the kingdoms of men. Now notice what this says, and we're studying all of this in relationship with the closing scenes of the life of Christ and the closing scenes of this earth's history. The Bible tells us here in Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 6, 
it says, Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. We recognize that this is a principle here. What God has brought together, no man is to separate. So what does the opposite mean? What God has separated, nobody is to put together. Okay. So his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is not supposed to be joined to this world. Okay. And two of the things that God has separated is church and state. God has said that these two things are to remain separate. The image of the beast or Satan says, no, we're going to bring these two things together. We're going to join them together. In fact, we see these things illustrated in Revelation chapter uh, 17. And we're going to look at those verses in just a few moments. But notice what your Bible says, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Let's just go over a couple of chapters in Matthew 22. And we're going to be looking at verse number uh, 21. Christ further illustrating this point that his kingdom is not to be uh, joined up with the kingdom of this world, that what he has separated is supposed to remain separated. The Bible says these words, it says, they say unto him, Caesars. We know that what, what took place here, Christ, uh, in fact, in verse 19, if we just back up, it says, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, whose is, the, is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Christ once again further illustrating here. And basically Christ with this penny, with this currency, Christ is demonstrating or illustrating his people, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Uh, when Christ returns again, what is he going to do with each and every individual? He is going to look at them and see, in fact, even before that, Christ is going to see very clearly whose image and whose superscription or whose name is on each and every person. Okay, that's what he's looking at. And he's going to say, render unto Caesar or render unto Satan the things that are Satan's and unto God the things that are God. God is going to gather all of his precious jewels into his treasure house. And so we see here God saying, listen, my kingdom, Satan's kingdom, Caesar, my kingdom, they're two separate kingdoms. Church and state are divided. They're separated. But we see here that it's Satan's desire to bring these two together. Now, as we turn in our Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, or actually Isaiah, we're going to go to Jeremiah, but let's go to Isaiah first. Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54. Notice what your Bible says in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5. We see here that God has told us as a church, as the people of God, in fact, we're, we're, we're going to see some things uh, that this has not been so from the beginning of time, even until now. God has told us that we are to remain separate from the world. Uh, we're not to be partakers of the world's practices, of its uh, traditions, of its uh, holidays, whatever it's to be wherever it may be, we as God's people are to remain separate. Uh, but not only separate in that regard, but even in our business, uh, we are to remain separate. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean in just a few moments. We'll, we'll, we'll go a little further. But Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5, notice what it says in verse 5. It says, for thy maker, God speaking to his church, for thy maker is what? Thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. So God tells us his relationship to his church is what? He is our husband, correct? Now, what is a husband's job? What is his duty for his wife or for his spouse or for his family? He is supposed to provide, okay? God has told us as his people that, listen, I will provide all of your needs. I will take care of you. I will make sure that you have what you need. Okay. Notice what the Bible says in John chapter or Jeremiah chapter 31. Let's just go to Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. So God has promised to us. He has covenanted with us that we are not uh, to look to another to provide for us. We are only to look to him. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 31. And let's look at verse 32. 
And when you get there, amen. <clears throat> the Bible says here, it says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them up out of the land of Egypt. It says, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, said the Lord. So once again here, Christ is saying, listen, I am your husband. Okay. This was Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 32. Okay. So God, once again, compares his relationship to his church as the husband, as the provider, as the one who protects and takes care of. Now, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. God, once again, here illustrating this point. And this is something that we all need to, if we have not come to the understanding of already, we need to have this experience with God to know that God does love us enough to take care of us. We don't have to depend on anyone to be our provider, but we can depend upon God. It says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, it says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a, as a chaste virgin to Christ. Who, so who is our husband? Christ is. And what does the Bible say? He has espoused us unto how many husbands? One husband. We don't have many husbands. We have one husband. And so as we look here in the Bible, what does the Bible tell us about the relationship between a husband and a wife? In fact, turn with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Notice what the law says in Romans chapter 7 and verse 2. Romans chapter 7. Notice what the laws of the Bible are. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 2, Christ says that he is our provider. He is our husband. He is the one who takes care of us. It says in verse 2, Romans chapter 7 and verse 2, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So how long are we bound to Christ once we're married to Christ? Until he dies. And is Christ going to die, brothers and sisters? No, Christ is not going to die. Christ ever liveth, the Bible says, to make intercession for us. Christ is living, okay? Christ is eternal. And so we see that we are bound to Christ as long as he lives. Now, what does the Bible say about the men of this earth? Notice what it says in the book of Revelation chapter 17. Notice what it says about the men, the individuals of this earth. Notice what they do according to the scriptures. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 17 and verse number one and two, it says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth had committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth had been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. What do we see the kings of the earth doing? We see them fornicating. We see them coming together with this great mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. We see a union here forming, correct? Okay. We see what? The church joining with the state. We see the church joining with the state here. In fact, in the book of Revelation chapter 18, we just look over uh, just to the next chapter, verses 2 and 3. Notice what it says. And he cried mightily. This is the mighty angel that comes down. This is a representation of God's people in the last days. Uh, this is the message that we are going to be carrying forward to the world. It says, and he cried mightily with a, lot, with a strong voice saying, Babylon, is fall, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So what do we see? Uh, this this, this uh, message that is coming to the earth, the message that God's people are going to be uh, proclaiming throughout the world. Uh, Babylon has fallen. Why? Because the kings of the earth, the nations of the earth have joined themselves to her. 
Now, God has told us that we need to keep two things separated. And those two things separated are what? Church and state. Okay. Church and state, we're to keep separated. But I want to show you something or want to reveal something here in the book of John. John chapter 19. Looking at the closing scenes of the life of Christ, we're in John chapter 19. I want you to notice something here that we see transpiring and taking place in the time of Christ. Okay, This is something that took place in the time of Christ. These scenes are going to repeat themselves. They're, they are repeating themselves. There's, many, there's statement after statement that say that God's people are, are repeating the, the, the history of ancient Israel. And notice what one of those things was. We're in John chapter 19 and verse 14. It says, and it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, behold, what? Your king. Who is this speaking here? This is Pilate. OK, in verse 13, you can read. This is Pilate. OK, Pilate is uh, 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 speaking here. OK, so it goes on to say in verse 15, but they cried out away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but who? Caesar. What did, what did the church say? What did the church say? The church said, We have no king but Caesar. Now, when you read Sister White's commentary on this, she said that even though they hated the Romans, who did they hate more? They hated Christ more. They hated Jesus more. And so they would rather embrace the state, embrace Roman, the Romanism, embrace the Romans rather than to embrace Christ. So what do we see here? Who do they have or who are they taking to them for their king? Rome. The state, right? Listen, we will join with you just as long as... You take care of this problem that we have, which is Christ. So in the final scenes or the closing scenes of the life of Christ, we see church and state coming together. Okay? We see church and state coming together. We see the church going to the world, the church going to the Romans and saying, listen, our king is not the king of glory. Our king is Caesar. Our king is Caesar. And we're going to see why. We're going to see why in just uh, a few moments. But notice, what was the result of this this uh, this proclamation or this declaration. What was, the, what was the result? The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Notice what it says in Matthew 23. And we're going to look at verse 38. So the Jews, they come out and they say, listen, we have no king but Caesar. Notice the result of their proclamation. It says in here in Matthew chapter 23 and verse uh, 38, what does Christ say unto them? He says, Behold, your house is left unto you what? Desolate. Because you have left or separated yourself from the king of glory and chosen Caesar as your king, your house has left unto you desolate. Okay? So I want you to notice something once again. As the church of God, the Jews... The Pharisees, the religious leaders of Christ's day, embrace the state, embrace the leadership or the rulership of the Romans. Christ tells them that their house now, their house, the church, says is left unto you desolate. Okay, Desolate. In other words, it's no longer his house. It's no longer his father's house. He says it's desolate. Okay, it's desolate. Now, as we continue to read here, go to chapter 21 for me. Chapter 21 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21. And let's look at verse number 43. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43. I want you to notice something here in the words of Christ. It says these words. It says, therefore, say I unto you. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. And what does it say? And given to a nation doing what? Amen. Bringing forth the fruits thereof. So God says, because you have not 
acknowledge me as your ruler, as your supreme Lord, as your husband, I'm taking the kingdom from you and I'm giving it to another. Those, but, but who is he giving it to? Who does Christ specify he's giving it to here? Those that are what? Bringing forth fruits. Okay. Who is it that brings forth fruits in the last days? Those that are receiving the early and the latter rain. Okay. Okay. Those that are receiving the early and the latter rain. These are the individuals that are uh, bringing forth fruit unto holiness and unto righteousness. Luke chapter 19. Let's go there really quickly. Luke chapter 19. These verses we've looked at before, but we're just going to look at them again in light of what we're studying now. Notice what it says, Luke chapter 19 and verse 41. The Jews here in the final scenes of the life of Christ, we see the head or the leadership going and saying, listen, we want to get rid of this man. It is expedient that this man die, that, that the whole nation not perish, that we lose not our place in the earth. And so we will embrace uh, Caesar if it means to just get rid of this individual right here. Christ says, your house is left unto you desolate. Christ says, listen, what I desire to do for you, I'm going to, to give to those who are bearing the fruits of righteousness and holiness. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says, and when he came near, he beheld the city. And what did he do, brothers and sisters? Oh, he wept over it. And it's interesting, brothers and sisters, because you see Jesus in his ministry. You see him weeping three times. Three times he weeps. Okay? He weeps three times. Here is one of the times that he weeps. And Sister White, she says that he was weeping bitterly. I mean, he, it, was, it, was, it, was a way, it was like somebody had died. He was weeping so hard. And he was, as he was looking at the city, and why was he weeping? He was crying because as he looked at the city, he saw people who had embraced the world, who had embraced everything about the world, and who had not embraced the light that he had come to give them. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Christ came to give them messages of peace and holiness and righteousness so that his children might be gathered together. He said, how oft have I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks? But she would not. You didn't want to. You didn't want to hear these messages. And so Christ has tried to gather his people, and he, he looks at the city, and he looks at what, what was he looking at specifically? He was looking at the temple. Was he not? When you look at the Desire of Ages, she, she says that he, he beheld the temple and it's in all of its glory and its beauty. And the people began to shout and sing as they saw this temple. And they said, man, look, look at how beautiful this temple is. And Christ, when he saw it, he wept. He wept bitterly because he recognized, and the Bible says here in verse 42, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Just as we were, we were talking about earlier when you, they deliver the, the book to the man that is learning, what does he say? It's sealed up. When they deliver the book to the man that is not learning, what, he's, what does he say? I'm not learning. I, I can't understand this. We see that the spirit of deep sleep had been poured out upon the people of God. They were sleeping. They couldn't see. They were Laodiceans, right? Laodicea can't see, right? Cannot see. Their eyes are not open. And so Christ says, listen, you can't even see the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. You're blind to them. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench round about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. Christ was telling them, listen, the people that you are embracing, the people that you say that this is our king, guess what? They're your enemies and you don't even know it. They're your enemies, and one day they're going to come, and they're going to kill you all. And it says, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. It says, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Christ wept because the people did not have faith in his word, and they didn't have faith in him. Why, did I, why do I say that they did not have faith in his word? Because as we studied before and as we'll see in, in just a few moments, the messages of John the Baptist was based on Daniel chapter 9, which was a prophetic message given from Gabriel himself. Today, God's people are rejecting the same message of Daniel chapter 9, which is based that was given by Gabriel to his people. 
We're going to see that in just a few moments. We're rejecting the same message. This was the message of William Miller. This is the message of God's people in the last days. We see here God's people rejecting the message and he's weeping. He's weeping. When did Jesus cry the first time? You recognize that Jesus, when Lazarus was in the grave, you remember? The Bible says, the shortest verse in the Bible says, Jesus wept. He wept. Why was he weeping? Because Lazarus died? No, he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. But because the people didn't know who he was. They said, Jesus, we believe in you. Martha sat there and said, Jesus, I know that God will do whatever you say. I know he will do whatever you say. But, you know, my brother, you know, we know he's going to be raised up in the last days. Wait a minute. That's a contradiction, right? If you believe that I'm the Christ, if you believe that I'm, I'm God, if you believe that God is going to do and answer whatever prayer that I send before him, but then you believe that Lazarus is going to raise up at the last days. Lord, don't take away the stone. By, by now his body stink. It, it stinketh. Don't do that. And Jesus looked around at the people and he said, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know the power that I have to resurrect and save them. They don't even know who I am, which was based upon prophecy. They don't know. And brothers and sisters, today, God's people don't know who he is. They don't know who he is prophetically, and they don't know who he is by an experience. They don't know the power of the resurrection of Christ because they've not experienced it in their lives. They don't know who he is prophetically, guess what, because we're saying we don't need to understand prophecy. And so Christ is visiting his people. His people are taking the words of God and they're throwing them to the side. And what is Christ doing? He's weeping. He's weeping. He's crying. He's weeping right now. But we see here Christ weeping over his people. We see Jerusalem as a result of their rejection of the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. We see them casting or we see judgment being cast upon them. Now, you may ask yourself the question, well, what does this have to do with the image of the beast? What does it have to do with these last days? I want to show you some things. This statement says here, signs of the times, March 22nd, 1910. It says, when the Protestant churches shall unite with the secular powers to sustain a false religion for opposing uh, which their ancestors endured fiercest per the fiercest persecution, when the state shall use its power to enforce the decrees, and what else? And what else? Sustain the institutions of the churches. It says, then will Protestant America have formed an image to the papacy, and there will be a, nas and there will be a national apostasy which will end only in national ruin. How do we see that this image is formed? How do we see that these things come together? How do we see this church and state relationship come together? It says, when the state shall use its power to enforce the, the decrees of apostate Protestantism and also to do what? Sustain the institutions of the church. Okay. Now, we just read some verses. Who is it that sustains us as the people of God? What did the Bible say? It's God that is our husband. It's God that provides for us. It is God that takes care of us. It is God that sustains us, brothers and sisters. He is our provider. Did he not reveal that to us? You see, the greatest condemna condemnation is going to come upon us today because we have the history of ancient Israel. We have that history. God sustained those people in a desert, in a wilderness for 40 years. They didn't have, they weren't in an a, a, a oasis. They didn't have a, a paradise out there. But God provided for each of their needs. He caused food to drop out of the sky. He caused water to come from rocks. He did so many things for them and providing for them. And so greater condemnation comes upon us. Why? Because we have all that history. We've seen how the Lord has provided. And yet, guess what? We're still denying that as a people. Notice what this says here. Notice what this says. You may say, well, well, well I, don't, I don't see where we're going. This is the image of the beast right here. Notice what this goes on to say here. Notice, this is in the time of Christ. This is Christ. I don't know if you can see the picture, but this is Christ coming into the temple to cleanse it. 
The disciples had been filled with awe and wonder at Christ's prediction of the overthrow of the temple. So this is when Christ had left the temple and said, listen, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And the, and, and the disciples were, they were like, what? What are you talking about? They were filled with awe at Christ's prediction of the overthrow of the temple. And they desired to understand more fully the meaning of the words. Wealth, labor, and architectural skill have for more than 40 years been freely expended to enhance its splendors. Herod the Great had lavished upon it both what? Both what? Roman wealth and what? Jewish treasure. And even the emperor of the world had enriched it with his gifts. What do we see here? What do we see taking place? Do we see the kingdom of the world sustaining the church of God? Sustaining its institutions? Building up its temples, its churches, its hospitals, its schools? Do we see that here? Yes. Herod, not only Herod, but Caesar funded, funded the temple, fund, put money into it, gave, put money, all these things. And the church, do you think that they said, hey, no, listen, we, we don't want that. Uh, uh, we, we shouldn't be accepting money from you. Do you think they did that? No, they received that money to sustain their institutions. They received those things from the world to sustain them. And as a result, brothers and sisters, guess what? There became a union whereby they didn't think that they would survive if they, if, if they severed those ties. They didn't feel that they could separate and still survive. Why? Because they had become dependent. It is not God's will. And this is one of the reasons why God wants us to live in the country. Because he does not want us to be dependent upon man to sustain us, brothers and sisters. That's just the fact of the matter. God wants us to be dependent upon him and him only. But we see here that his people at this time, the time of Christ in his closing scenes, they had become so dependent on the Roman wealth that this is one of the reasons why they said we have no king but Caesar. Because guess why? Caesar has been providing for us. Caesar has been taking care of us. Caesar is why our buildings are this big. Caesar is why we have schools and we have all these different things. This is why. And so they said, listen, we can't, we can't separate Remember, what did they say? They said in, in, in John chapter 9, just go there, I'm sorry, John chapter 11. Just go there real quickly. John chapter 11. Notice what it says in verse 49. John chapter 11, verse 49. It says, and, and one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest this, that same year, said unto them, ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us. For who? For the leadership. For the rulers in Jerusalem, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people that the whole nation not perish. And this spake he not of himself, but of being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. He said, listen, we, we have to get rid of him or else we will lose our place and the nation. We'll lose it all. We'll lose our positions. We'll lose our jobs. We'll lose our, our pensions, our 401k plans. We'll lose it if we separate from, 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 from Caesar and we embrace Christ and we embrace this message because persecution will follow. And so listen, we have to, even though we hate the state, even though we hate Caesar, we, he has to be our friend. This is what was taking place, brothers and sisters. This is in the final scenes of, of, of Christ's life. And this is why, this is why, and I tell people all this, this, this all the time. This is why the religious leaders of his day, this is why Christ didn't go to their schools. This is why John the Baptist didn't go to their schools. This is why Christ didn't pick people from their schools because they could not finish the work. They could not because of their ties to Caesar. They couldn't do it. They could not do it, brothers and sisters. They had yoked themselves up so closely. Remember, they were, they were spying around John because they, well, man, is this going to cause the, the, the unrest of the Romans? Are the Romans going to be upset with us because of what John is preaching? We need to maintain that relationship. We need to make sure that relationship stays together. So we, John, hey, tone it down, John. 
this is what was happening. But yet there were Romans at the preaching of John who were convicted and converted because of John's preaching. Massive blocks of white marble of all almost fabulous size forwarded from Rome for this purpose formed a part of its structure and to these the disciples had called the attention of their master saying see what manner of stones and what buildings are here look at these Christ look look at what Rome has given to us look at what Rome has given to us and many people today it's sad to say brothers and sisters many people today are pointing to our institutions, they're pointing to our, our schools, our, our hospitals, and, 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 and not all of them are tied to the state, but the majority of them here in the United States, guess what? They're tied to the state. That's why God needs little blueprint schools. That's why he needs little med medical missionary schools and blueprint schools. That's why, that's why one of the works of Elijah before Elijah was translated was going by and visiting all the schools and putting them back in order. Because guess what? Who was in power at that time? Jezebel was. Jezebel and Ahab. What, what, what do we have with Jezebel and Ahab? Church and state. And so who was running the schools? Church and state. And so the prophet Elijah had to go to the schools and undo all of that. This is why God needs schools. He needs uh, 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 sanitariums that are modeled after his pattern. We see here the Jews embracing the wealth, the labor, all of the things of the state. We see them embracing it. And as a result, as Christ looked upon the city, as he looked upon the temple, he wept over it because he knew that it was going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed. Notice what these quotations say here. And then I'm going to show you some things. And I don't want you to be alarmed. Uh, hopefully you're not alarmed. But brothers and sisters, I, I, I'm just pointing this out because it's there. Okay? And when I say it's there, I don't mean that... Uh, I mean, it, it's something that if, if our people are not... Their eyes are not open to, then they're not going to make it, brothers and sisters. They're going to be deceived. And the Bible tells us uh, in the book of Joel... The Bible says we're to lift up our voice like a trumpet, right? Sound the alarm in the holy mountain, right? An alarm is, is something that warns people, right? Does not alarm warn people? Fire alarm warns people. There's a fire, right? Mm -hmm. An alarm also does what? It wakes people up when they're asleep. The Bible tells us that we're to show unto the house of Jacob their sins. This is not, I'm not doing these things because uh, uh, I, I desire to. As I was praying and getting ready for this meeting, the Lord said, remember that? You need to do that. You need to share this because I had totally forgot about this particular presentation. We have joined ourselves with the state by allowing the state to sustain our institutions. Do you know that it is a fact, a fact, because I heard this from one of the top lawyers in Adventism with my own ears back in 2002 heard it with my own ears that in the state of California if they were to remove all of the support that the government gave them that we can only have one school open in California and one hospital okay. now that's in comparison to I think about five hospitals and maybe about three or four schools that if we were to remove all of the government grants, all the federal grants, all of these things, if we were to stop receiving them, that we could only have one school open and one hospital open. How much are they sustaining us, brothers and sisters? And as a result, because the government says, hey, listen, we're giving you this money, are, are there strings attached to that money? Oh, you better believe it. Oh, you better believe there are strings attached to that money. Yes. And so we have, as just in the days of Christ, we have joined ourselves. We have linked ourselves up with the secular powers. That's part of, and what was the image of the beast? Or uh, what was the test for God's people? She said she was shown clearly that the image of the beast was to be the test for God's people. The union of church and state. 
It says here, if believers in the truth are not sustained by their faith in these comparatively peaceful days, how are we supposed to be sustained? By our faith in these peaceful days with the footmen. What will uphold them when the grand test comes and the decree goes forth against all those who will not worship the image of the beast and receive his mark in their forehead or in their hands? It says, this solemn period is not far off. Instead of becoming weak, it says, and irresolute, the people of God should be gathering strength and courage for the time of trouble. Now, we talked about the image of the beast. We talked about how God has warned us uh, as his people that we are not to join ourselves with the state. What would happen if we joined ourselves with the state? What, what happened to, now we know that in the Bible that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. We recognize that the history of ancient Israel is the same exact history that we see uh, that, that is being repeated today. And what do we see ancient Israel doing uh, as they join themselves to the world in their time? Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Deuteronomy, chapter 6. <coughs> Notice what it says here in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. In fact... In fact, turn with me to Deuteronomy 4, chapter 4, chapter 4. Notice what it says in verse 15. In fact, yes, let's read verse 15. But I, in fact, let's, let's just back up to verse 9, verse 9, and we'll read, we'll read forward. It says, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou do what? Forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. So God, is, there's a warning here, divine warning, that we need to be careful lest we do what? Forget. Does Sister White talk about forgetting? Yes. We, she says we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget. The way the Lord has led us in his past teaching in our past history and it's teaching in our, in our past history we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget so God says here listen take heed to thyself that I keep thy soul diligently lest I forget the things which thine eyes have seen okay now it wasn't there a blessing on somebody's eyes uh, in the Bible wasn't there a blessing the Bible says blessed are the eyes or Sister White says, blessed are the eyes which saw the things when? The the it's a blessing upon the 1335, right? It, it was a blessing that came upon the people of God during that time period, okay? 1843, 1843, 1844. It's a blessing, okay? Skip down with me to verse 23. What happens if we are to forget? Notice what, what happens if we do forget how God uh, has led us in the past and, and, and we forget all that he has done for us. It says, take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord, your God, which he made with you, and make you a what? Wait a minute. What are we talking about right now? We're talking about the image of the beast, right? So God says when we forget what he has done for us in the past, what do we do? We make a graven image or the likeness of anything which, it says, which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. When we forget how God has led us in the past, once again, we make a graven image unto the Lord, or we make a graven image uh, or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. I wonder, brothers and sisters, I wonder, I, I, I wonder if we as, as God's people, if we have made images to, to anything or any likeness of anything. I wonder. Notice this. Notice, notice these things. Now, this, this is what happens when we make a graven image. Now, we know we're talking about here uh, the children of Israel. And what did they make a graven image unto the Lord? Yes. They, well, not unto the Lord, but they made a graven image. Okay. And they, this image was the image of the beast. And they said, this be the gods that have led us out of Egypt. Okay. I wonder if the people of God 
would do the same thing. If the people of God would begin to make images. Now, we may say, well, no, I don't see any images in, in the church today. I don't see any images. But brothers and sisters, have we not formed the, the image to the beast here as we have have we, as we have connected ourselves with the state? Yes. But even prior to that, I want, I want to show you something here. I don't know if you can see that. This is in Loma Linda, California. Okay. The Bible says, thou shalt, make, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now, we make this image and we say, listen, well, you know, this is illustrating or demonstrating what? The Good Samaritan. And, you know, this is the work that we do here. But what does God say? We're not to make any image or any likeness. But what, what is happening? What am I demonstrating here? We're moving further and further away from the truth. This is Barron Springs, Michigan, Andrews University. What do we see here? Uh, we see Jay and Andrews, right? Well, he was a good man, right? So we should make an image to him. Okay. Another image. What do we see here? This is Oakwood College. Okay. What do we see? Or Oakwood University. We see an image on their campus now. And it's interesting to me because on every single campus, notice, notice what this says, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. But here we're making images and we're paying homage to these things. Los Area University, I don't know if you can kind of see that, but there's a great image out there of the, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. And you see the father coming out to throw his, his, this garment of righteousness on, on, the, on the son there. But you see more and more images popping up on our campuses, popping up everywhere. Now you may say, well, what's the big deal of that? Well, God has told us here that we're not to be making any images. What, what, what church has images in it? Yeah. Yes. And so we see here, because we have, as leadership, as we're allowing them to sustain our institutions, what's, what's taking place in our institutions? We see images, graven images popping up all over. Notice this next slide. Now people may say, well, what, what? brothers and sisters, this is what's going on here. In uh, La Sierra, there's a path that they call Path of the Just. Now, no relation here, just so you know, okay? But their Path of the Just, notice what this says here. This is, I'm, this is taken from their own periodical. The goal of Path of the Just is to transform the La Sierra University campus mall into a series of patios and trees that will honor individuals who stand as role models for our students. Individuals whose lives of altruistic service have fostered human rights. Now that's deep right there because human rights, where did that come out of brothers and sisters? That came out of the French Revolution. That's where human rights came from. Okay, that's, that's where the whole, and it's interesting because I have a picture of it, I didn't put it in here, but when they, when they built the human rights, when they wrote the human rights, you know what they wrote them on? Two tables of stone. That's what they had them on. And there was a serpent encircling them. Okay, that's what the human, yeah, yeah. It says individual empowerment. Now, individual empowerment, what is that? That's good dog. This is La Sierra University. It says in religious toleration. Oh, brothers and sisters, I wish I had time to really deal with that, but we'll, we'll continue to read. It says each continent has foliage. Now, what's another name for foliage? Groves, trees, right. Each continent has foliage native to its home, allowing the diverse student body of La Sierra University to enjoy something from their homeland while being reminded of, a, of role models who hopefully they will be inspired to emulate, says Lawrence Garrity, Ph.D., president of La Sierra University. Now, this is, he's not president anymore, but uh, this is some years ago. It says, we are proud to have been named most diverse in the West by U.S. News and World Reports. 
best colleges and universities for the past four years. This is another way of celebrating that diversity. So, hey, we, who do we point to as uh, uh, uplifting us? We point to the world. We say, listen, the world has said we're, we're great in the world. Well, brothers and sisters, when the world calls you great, the, my Bible tells me that the world doesn't know God's people. That's what it says. In fact, turn to John chapter 14 really quickly just, just so you can see this. When the world recognizes you, God doesn't know you. Okay? When the world recognizes you, God does not know you. Okay? That's something here that's illustrated all throughout the Bible. Notice what it says here in uh, John chapter 14. And let's look at verse Let's look at verse 16. It says, and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter. In fact, verse 15, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So and then it says in verse 16, and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So are the condition of receiving the spirit is doing what? what? What does it say in verse 15? If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father that he sends you the comforter. So are our, the condition of receiving the comforter or the spirit of truth is that we keep the commandments of God. It says that in John chapter 5, I mean, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. It says the same thing. The Bible says that the spirit of God is given to them that obey him. It goes on to say in verse 17, it says, Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. We see that the world doesn't receive the spirit of truth. We see that the world does not know God. We see that by wisdom, the world knew not God. They, saw, they thought that the preaching of the cross was foolishness by the worldly wisdom. And so when we see the world saying, hey, this college is a good college, this is a great college, brothers and sisters, that should tell us something. It should open our eyes to something. Now, I'm not saying something that maybe some of you don't already know, but maybe those who are watching don't know. But what... That's it. Say that again. That's right. The men and women that they have in this path of the just that they call it is... Are, only two of them are Adventists. Mother Teresa is one of them. Uh, Desmond Tutu. Uh who are though both of those are Catholic uh, many other humanitarian people okay people who are not Adventists and so what they've done is they've got trees okay groves trees I'm not joking I've gone and seen it for myself and they have planted trees because I used to live here I went to school here this is where I grew up okay so what I'm saying I know firsthand I'm not just talking out of the air they have trees with the individual's names on it that it's dedicated to them. And you're supposed to go to the tree and say, man, I wish I, wish I could you know, be like this person. Emulate this individual. Worship. Worship. The groves. The Bible talks about the groves. How the children of Israel made groves in high places. It was one of Hezekiah's duties to go and cut these things down, to tear them down, brothers and sisters. But this is what's taking place. This is what's transpiring. Notice. Prophet of the Lord says here, it says, In the last vision given me, which was on December 10th, 1871, I was shown the condition of God's people. They are not awake and showing their faith by their works. I was pointed to ancient Israel. They had great light and exalted privileges, yet they did not live up to the light or appreciate their privileges. And their light became darkness, and they walked in the light of their own eyes instead of the counsel of God. They knew not the time of their visitation. The light that God gave them, what did it become? Darkness. What does Sister White say? Darkness in proportion to the light given will fall upon their pathway. It says, the people of God in these last days are following the example of ancient Israel. The great sin of ancient Israel was in turning from God to idols. This is also the great sin of who? Who is modern Israel? Seven, seven day Adventism. We see the union of church and state in the time of Christ. We see it in our day when 
the government, the state sustains our institutions. That's what's happening today. It's no secret. That, that, that's no secret, brothers and sisters. When we at our churches receive government food so that people, when they come, you know, a certain day of the week. Did you guys know that? You know the, about the faith-based initiative where every single week the government sends food to all the churches and people come out of the community to get food from the church. That's what happens. Now, when the people are coming to your church to get food, are they thinking, man, these people are really providing for me. They're, they're giving to me. No, because they know already that it's the government who is giving you the food. They're just coming to get it. Okay? We are supposed to be the lenders and not the borrowers. We are supposed to be the individuals who show forth that God provides. He's our provider. And God will provide for you as well. That's what we're to show. But yet, guess what, brothers and sisters? That's, that's, that's not happening. Yes? What paragraph is that, the last one? Oh, you know what? I, I didn't get it catching in there. But I'll, I'll, I'll get it for you, though. I'll, I'll look it up here for you. Notice what this says, patriarchs and prophets. I'm, I'm going to end with a few more statements here. At first, this is speaking of, it's interesting, once again, the apostasy of the Jordan is likened unto the parable of the ten virgins, which is likened unto God's people in the last days. Do we have a tearing time at the apostasy of the Jordan? Yes. When the God's people came to the banks of the Jordan, did they cross over right away? No, there was a tearing people, a tearing time. And the prophet of the Lord talks about that. And she says that God wanted to see what was in the people's hearts. He wanted to continue to purify them. This is when, who came? Who came at the apostle? Who came at the Jordan? Balaam came. What did Balaam cause the people to do? The church to join with the world. That's what happened. And they began to bow down and worship images, right? Isn't that what took place? So the same history is repeating. At first, there was little intercourse between the Israelites and their heathen neighbors. But after a time, Midianitish women began to steal into their camp. Their appearance excited no alarm, and so quietly were their plans conducted that, their, that the attention of Moses was not called to the matter. It was the object of these women in their association with the Hebrews to seduce them into transgression of the law of God, to draw their attention to heathen rites, that's the world, and customs, that's the world, and lead them into idolatry. These motives, just, it's the world, brothers and sisters, just like other institutions, worldly institutions have images and graven images to different things. We say, okay, well, ours are Christian, though. They're modern after the Bible, so it's okay. No, it's the same thing. We're doing the same thing. These motives are, were seditiously, uh, studiously concealed under the garb of friendship so that they were not suspected even by the guardians of the people. How was it? These two men right here are Catholic priests. Now you may say, well, why do I have this up here? Well, the reason why is because the 10th Swallow Mission Lectureship will be Monday at the chapel of the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. Okay? Now this particular uh, lecture were these two men coming to our school, to Andrews University, to our seminary, and talking about how, notice what it says, the theme of the day is ever faithful, always changing. Postcards from the history and theology of mission. The lecture will feature guest speakers from the Catholic Theological Union of Chicago, Stephen Bivens, a professor of mission and culture, and former missionary to the Philippines, and Roger Schroeder, a professor of Catholic miss, 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 missology, it says, and former missionary to Papua New Guinea. So the schedule is as follows, a prophet, a guru, and a bishop. And they talk about one of the Catholic, uh, uh, one of their uh, teachers, okay? Um, certainty, ferment, crisis, and rebirth. Emerge, emerging world Christianity, Jesus as universal Savior, Catholics and Seventh-day Adventists in mission. A single but complex reality, the manifold aspects of mission today. We, we, we need to join together. We need to come together and be in mission together. Brothers and sisters, listen, I'm going to say this, and I don't care what people think. 
But the bottom line is, this is what's happening. I'm not, I'm not going around looking for this information. This information, this was in a secular newspaper in Michigan, okay? And God's people's eyes need to be open to this heresy and the foolishness that's taking place in our institution. We, we need to wake up. The Bible says we need to sound the alarm in, the holy mount, in, in God's holy mountain, and we need to be doing something about these things. This is what's taking place, brothers and sisters. So this, these, all of these things coming together as we bring this to a close, it says the seal of the living God will be placed upon those, who, those only who bear a likeness to Christ in character. As wax takes the impression of the seal, so the soul is to take the impression of the Spirit of God and retain the image of Christ. Many will not receive the seal of God because they do not keep his commandments or bear the fruits of righteousness. The great mass of professing Christians will meet with bitter disappointment in the day of God. They have not upon their foreheads the seal of the living God. Lukewarm and half-hearted, they dishonor God far more than, they av than the avowed unbeliever. They grope in darkness when they might be walking at in the noonday light of the word under the guidance of one who never errs. As I saw what we must be in order to inherit glory and then saw how much Jesus had suffered to obtain for us so rich an inheritance, I pray that we might be baptized into Christ's sufferings. And that's what we have to do, brothers and sisters. We need to pray that we be baptized into his sufferings so that we may be able to value these things. It says, I pray that we might be baptized into Christ's sufferings, that we might not shrink at trials, but bear them with patience and joy, knowing that what Jesus had suffered, that we through his poverty and suffering might be made rich. Said the angel, deny self, ye must step fast. Some of us have had time to get the truth and to advance step by step, and every step we have taken has given us strength to take the next. But now time is almost finished, and what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. They will also have much to unlearn. Remember, we talked about that. We talked about that. We need to get this, this foolishness this, as the, the disciples had in them. This is why they were sleeping, because they were drunk with the wine of the Pharisees. They believed that Jesus was going to have an earthly kingdom. That's what they were being taught. That's why they were sleeping in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, and what we have been years learning, it says they will also have to learn in a few months. They will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. What's, what's much to learn again? That's something that has already taken place where? In the past. We have things that we need to learn, brothers and sisters, again. Those who would not receive the mark of the beast and his image when the decree goes forth must have decision now to say, nay, we will not regard the institution of the beast. We need to have, we have to make the decision when? Now, right now. To say, listen, we're not going to regard the institution of the beast. One final statement here. It says, what are you doing, brethren, in the great work of preparation? Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mode and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly mode and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. When the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. Now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious world-loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men or women of false tongues or deceitful hearts. All who receive the seal must be without spot before God, before God, candidates for heaven. Go forward, my brethren and sisters. I can only write briefly upon these points at this time, merely calling your attention to the necessity of preparation. Search the scriptures for yourselves that you may understand.
the fearful solemnity of the present hour. Brothers and sisters, we need to search the scriptures for ourselves. We need to pray and ask God that he would prepare us for what is coming upon the earth so that we might be able to stand. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, as we have come before you, Lord, as we see the, the signs of the times, Lord, I pray that we as individuals would make a covenant with you that we would not join ourselves to the world, that we would not allow the world to sustain us, but that we would allow you to be our provider, our husband. And Father, I ask and pray that you would help our brothers and sisters who are sleeping. And Lord, even we ourselves to awaken up out of the stupor and to work quickly for our redemption draweth nigh. Father, we thank you so much for your word and we just continue to ask and pray that your spirit would move upon our hearts, that you would bless us as we continue to study and search your word today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.